Good afternoon. This is the Bishop's Desk. Pray that you're having a great day today. Pray that all is well. Pray that God is blessing you in the space that you're in right now. We're back here at the Word of God on this week. I pray that the Word of God was a blessing to you on last week. I know it was a blessing unto me uh, just being able to search the Word of God and to grow in the Word of God through the knowledge of truth. And so we're moving along here in 1 Peter. And so we're going to get right to the Word of God today. Uh, we're going to bypass our devotions on this week. And we're going to go right into the Word of God. Um, we're here in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, around verse 12 and 13. We finished last week. Uh, dearly beloved in verse 11 and 12. Well, we were 13 and 14 today. Um, last week we uh, was 12 having our conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which shall, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. And so we saw here in the word of God where our conversation being translated a nostril fee. I believe that's what it was. A N A S T R O P H E. I believe I could, I'm probably wrong, but a nostril fee, I believe, translated good works, uh, conversation into good works. Normally, when we think of conversation, we think of what we say out of our mouth. But you also can speak what you what you do is conversation, your actions is conversations. And and God gave that to me um, in my spirit on, on this week as I was traveling on all last week about um, your conversation, your actions is a conversation all by itself. You know, the statement that they say, it's not what you say, it's what you do. So people are watching you. And so what they're watching they're watching the conversation of your life. So he says to let your conversation uh, be honest. Let your actions be honest amongst the Gentiles. That whereas they speak against you, they're going to speak against you regardless. They're going to speak against you regardless. But you must continue to allow your conversation to remain honest. You must continue to allow your good works to be honest regardless. We're not controlled by what we do, by what people do. We're controlled by the word of God. Amen? And so he said, let your conversation continue to be honest among the Gentiles. That by your good works, your good works will speak for you. What you do will speak for you. This is why conversation is translated into behavior because your good works will speak for you. They will see. And when they see the good works, this word behold, see, glorify God. God will get the praise. God will get the praise in the day of visitation. And we and we saw the day of visitation could be the day that when Christ appear, but it's also could be talking about the day in which God came into the, the unbeliever life and changed their life when he visited them based on your conduct, your conversation. It was your conduct, your conversation that remained honest in spite of the evil words or accusations or things that was done against you, your conversation remained honest. So therefore, the Spirit of God visited them. They glorified God because they were not able to persuade your conversation. So when we learn... In studying it, it was either or. It could be when Christ returned. 
or it could be the day when the spirit fell upon the unbeliever. So then we go into verse 13. He says, well, we'll start today. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. So he says, submit, uh, be subject, he's talking about. Be subject, uh, Christians are under command to obey human laws and civil rulers as long as they do not transgress the laws of God. So in other words, the laws that are in the land today, as believers, we are instructed to obey the laws that's in the land. The laws that's in the land today that even though you may not agree with them all, these laws that are in the land today, God has permitted them. Some of the laws in the land today, we deem not to be fair to uh, some group of people and, 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 and favor other group of people. Regardless, God has permitted them all. And he tells us whether they're just or unjust. He just tells us to do what? Submit ourselves to the laws. In other words, obey the laws. Whether you agree with them or not, obey them. For the simple fact, you're doing it for the Lord's sake. Because again, it goes back to a nostril fee, your conduct being honest because it's for the Lord's sake because the moment someone can attach Christ to your life and you're not obeying the laws, they will begin to associate that with Christ because we do know there's always naysayers that speak against the kingdom of God and speak against Christ because they don't want to submit to Christ being their Lord and their Savior. And so we know that uh, the aha, I told you people are always there saying, aha, I told you that that's why I don't go to church. That's why I don't fool with those Christian people because they're hypocrites. So this is why he's saying, do it for Christ's sake. This is for Christ's sake. We suffer for the sake of Christ, that Christ is not blasphemed, that Christ is not talked against. So we suffer for his sake, right? So he tells us to submit. So then let's go over to, let's, let's see what Romans chapter 13 says. Romans chapter 13 about submission. Submitting yourselves to every ordinance. Ordinance is the simple laws. That's what ordinances are. They are laws that was created by man. That's what ordinances are. Laws that was created by man. And then there are some ordinances, there, there are two church ordinances that, that has, was created by God. Um, communion and water baptism are the two church ordinances. Okay? But then there are many ordinances that has been created by man. So he says in Romans, um, Paul writes to the church in Rome and he says, let every soul be subject unto the higher rulers. He didn't specify, he didn't separate um, um, whether you are a child of God or not. But he said, let every soul. Now, we could say he's talking to the body of Christ, which we do know the word of God is written to the church and not the world. But he says, let every soul. So that's everybody be subject unto the higher powers. Everybody must obey the laws. Everybody, whether believer or non-believer, obey the laws. For, for there is no power but of God. And all these powers that are in the land, they are of God. They were permitted by God. If God did not want it to come forward, he would not have allowed, allowed it to come forward. And again, you may not agree with some things, but God has permitted it because he said, be subject 
unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. There's no power but of God. And you may say in your mind, well, God, why do you allow this to be? So that he can get the glory. So that when he straightened the matter out, he'll get the glory. And you have to understand, too, that God has their, 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 their spiritual and righteous principalities and there are wicked principalities. And God has given Satan the time now to, to operate through wicked principalities in this space, in this time of existence. But there is no power that has been created that God has not permitted. Okay? All power belong to God. The power that be are ordained of God. There you go. The power that be, the powers that be are ordained of God. God has permitted these things. Okay? Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, even the, the power of truth, the power of the word of God, speaking to the people of God, was ordained by God. Not man, but by God. So he says, whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth, look, resisteth the ordinance of God. So you, you resist God by not obeying the powers that be, by not obeying the rulers that be. So we'll bring it into the house of God, the pastor. God sets the pastor in the church. If he is a man of God, and if he is teaching the word of God, if he is um, um, in the word of God and you can see the word of God for yourself and you can examine the word of God and you can hear the word of God and the word that is coming forward, it is connecting with the spirit of truth that's in you. And and we get into this area where we may we may not agree or maybe a process or, or maybe something that the pastor has implemented or even the direction the pastor may be moving the church and you go against that ordinance. You don't go against the pastor. You go against God. Understanding God has set the pastor there if he's telling the truth. He has allowed some pastors to be even if they're not telling the truth. He has allowed them to be. He didn't set them there, but he allowed them to be there even if they're not telling the truth. But he says, for you to obey the powers and if you don't obey them, you go against God. And for a long time, I had a problem with telling people maybe if they're right, if they're wrong, um, confronting people on their uh, wrongdoings. Because one, I was careful because I knew that I was not a perfect vessel myself. However, God has placed me in this position and I believe and even other pastors that are teaching the truth. I believe I'm teaching the truth. Um, he, have, he has placed us here and for no goodwill of our own, we have to tell the truth. We, we, have to, we have to wave the white flag at times, right? And so I just felt like within myself, I didn't have the, the authority to tell you right or wrong, but God say, no, you must tell the truth. You must tell the people if they're right or wrong because I set you there with the ordinances, the word of God, the truth, the laws, that they would obey them. So when you don't obey your pastor, you go against God. I'll just leave it there. You go against God. You're not going against the, the man of God. You're going against God. Because he says, whosoever therefore resists the power, 
resist the ordinance of God. But you have to know and be in a place where the truth is. That first. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So when you resist, you receive to yourselves damnation. Pastor give you instructions, give you instructions. You resist. You don't want to do it. You don't feel like doing it. You bring damnation on yourself. Now, this, now, now all damnation is not unto death. Is not all, all damnation is not unto death. But sometimes blessings that would be, they're not. Um, maturity in the spiritual slows down because of disobedience. But you receive whatever damnation comes with your disobedience. You receive that. Because you don't resist man, you're resisting God. For rulers are not a terror, we're in uh, Romans 13, for rulers are not a terror to good works. God did not send me into this platform to scare you to do good. This is what he's saying. He did not send me in this space to scare you to do good. But to the evil, he sent me here to speak to the evil that is in us. And the evil that exists. But not to scare you. Not to scare you into good works. Because once God has entered into your life, good works Good conduct, anastrophe, good behavior should be part of your personality anyway because it is the personality of God. So it's no need now for me to be a terror unto you. It's no need for me to try to scare you because doing good should be easier now because God is in you. God is with you. It is easier to accomplish the good with God with you than with than him without you. It's easier. So he says the rulers are not sent to a terror to scare you unto good works, but to the evil. The rulers were sent to them that are evil, to the evil that's in you, the evil spirits, the evil people. The rule God sent us to terror that. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? So it's no need to be afraid of the power of God. Should we fear God? Absolutely, we should fear God. The Bible says we should fear God. We should fear the one that can destroy both the body and the soul. Right? That's what the scripture says. So we should fear God. But we shouldn't fear man. We shouldn't fear man. But we should fear God. And we should not, the Bible says, that wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? He asked a question. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good. If you're not, if you're not doing good, then you should be afraid. Basically, it's what he's saying here. Because if you're not being obedient to the power, to the ordinances of God that are coming through your pastor, you should be afraid. Why should you be afraid? Because you're reaping damnation on yourselves. But if you're doing good works, then there's no need to be afraid. If the Spirit of God is in you, the Spirit of God is going to drive you into doing good works automatically. So then there is no need to be afraid. Because why? You have submitted. Again, we go back to the beginning. This is about Christian submission. Because you have submitted unto the will and the process of God for the believer, you're going to be drawn automatically unto good works good conversation in your life 
because God is with you. So then he asked the question, will thou be afraid? Will thou be afraid of the power? There's no need to be afraid of the power. Why? Because he said, do that which is good. As long as you're doing that which is good, you won't reap damnation to yourself. So then for you who do good, there's no reason to be afraid of the power. But to you that consistently go against the ordinances of the power, the one, the rulers that is giving the law of God, then you should be afraid because you reap damnation to yourself. And thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. I am the minister of God to you for good. But if thou do that which is evil, but if thou do, but if thou disobey the man of God that has been sent to you for good, be afraid. For he breathed, for he beareth not the sword in vain. What is the sword? The word of God. He beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. This is wrath now. For he is the minister of God. For thee for good. But if thou do that what for that but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. So when he bring forth the word of God and he teaching the word of God, it's not in vain. It wasn't a waste of his time. Because then at that point. When the minister brings forth the word of truth, the sword, and you disobedient and you go against the word that he's teaching to you, now God steps in because it's not in vain. For he is the minister of God a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Now the wrath of God comes because of your disobedience and you did not resist the evil through your conduct. You now reap damnation on yourself. It's really dangerous. It's really dangerous as a believer when God has called you and 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 you don't follow the instructions of God, it's dangerous to deal with God that way. It is. It's very dangerous. So he tells you, submit yourselves to the ordinances of man for the Lord's sake, because again, it's all for the Lord's sake. If if the world, if the world, the unbeliever talks against Christ. And, and speak down on Christ and his existence because of your doing, because of your conduct, then that's damnation that you reap on yourself. This is why he says when we go back to Peter and we started, we, was, we started in Peter 13 saying, submit ourselves to the ordinances for the Lord's sake. We don't want to be the reason why the world, the evildoers, talk against the kingdom of God because of what we do. Because now you reap a greater condemnation on yourself because you have become the stumbling block and you have become the reason why they're talking against the kingdom of God.
or even the man of God. Um, I often promote in my personal life um, not having a whole bunch of group conversation. Because when people begin to talk, right, when people get hurt and people begin to talk, they begin to talk and say things out of a hurt space. And sometimes they talk against people out of a hurt space. And then if it's the ruler that or the king or the or or or, or the man of God that God sent and they talk against him in that space, they wreak damnation on themselves. So it's just good just to do good works, right? So then you go from there to um, let's go to Titus. Is that Titus? Yeah. Let's go to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3 and verse 1. He says, again, speaking to the believer to be subject unto their rulers, Christian submission, Titus says, Put them in mind, Titus 3 and 1, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to do every good work. This is what Titus says. Put you in mind to be subject to principalities. What is principalities? Hey, Google. What's the definition of principalities? Here's the definition of principality, a state ruled by a prince. A state ruled by a prince. A state ruled by a prince. God, let me see. Scripture. Prince and ruler of the world. Let me see. Mm. I'm looking for Satan. Second Corinthians four and four. Let me see. Let's see. Uh, Second Corinthians four. I know that's saying that. Okay. In whom Second Corinthians four and four. Well, verse three. But if our gospel be hid. It is here to them that are lost. In whom? The God of this world. The God of this world. Have blinded the, the minds of them which believe not. Least. The light of the glorious gospel of Christ. Who is the image of God should shine unto them. For we preach not of ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, have shined in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Uh, 
This is not what I want. For I too read the Prince of Melodious Verse, and now it's under the word narrative. But it says here, 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the eyes of those who don't believe. It's not saying that verbatim here. Hmm. I'm looking for a particular scripture. Mm. John 12, 31. Let me see if that one says. John 12, 31. I know y'all have already found it. Uh, 12, 31. Let's see. If this. John 12. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Okay, I'm looking for a different scripture where where Satan is the prince and ruler of this world. But look, John 12, John 12 and 30. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. So the prince of this world is Satan. He says he shall be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. So he says the prince of this world be cast out. That's Satan. Satan is the prince of this world. Right? So he tells us to put them in mind to be subject to principalities. Right? I was making the point that there's two different principalities. There's a wicked principality and there's a righteous principality. Hey, Google, what's the definition of principality? Here's the definition of principality. A state ruled by a prince. A state ruled by a prince. We know that there's a state that is ruled, and we're, we're not talking about Maryland, Virginia, uh, Connecticut. We're not talking about that state. We're talking about the state of your mind. Let's go back to our conduct. Uh, the state of your mind is ruled by a principality. Hey, Google, what's the definition of principality? Here's the definition of principality, a state ruled by a prince. A state ruled by a prince. If, you, if the state of your mind is ruled by Christ, if the state of your mind is ruled by Christ, you will have good conduct. If the state of your mind is ruled by Satan, who has been made the prince and ruler of this air, this time, this state, automatically, then your conduct will be that conduct of disobedience, which will produce evil works. So God says, Jesus says here in John 12 and 31, now is the judgment. Now is the judgment. We be, uh, God is judging right now. We're, we're not going to die and be judged. Now is the judgment. Look what he says. Turn your Bible to John 31. Now is the judgment. God is judging the principality of that be right now. He's judging it right now. Now is the judgment of this world. We're not going to die and be judged. This is why 
He asks, will thou be afraid? If your, if your conduct is not that of God, you should be afraid because you're being judged right now. He says, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince, let's translate prince in this context of scripture right here. Now shall the prince, now shall Satan, evil, evil works, evil principalities of this world be cast out. They're going to be cast out. Then he says after that, and I speak of himself now. If I be lifted up from the earth, oftentimes we, 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 we sing the songs and we sing the praises. That's just one way of lifting Christ up from the earth. That's a public, that's a public noise that is being made lifting up the name of Jesus from the earth, which is good, which is good, good to sing praises, to, to speak out your mouth with your tongue and lift him up from the earth, right? He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, but let's, let's, let's connect this to where we're at in the scripture. Let's connect this to uh, first Peter. Uh, let's go back. Let's connect this to first Peter 12, where we was last week, having your conversation honest amongst the Gentiles, right? And if I be lifted up from the earth, if and if and if your conversation remain honest from the earth, I will draw men unto me. You can you can put that in there. You can put that in there where Christ says, and, and if I be lifted up from the earth. And if, and if I, comma, have your conversation be honest amongst the Gentiles. And if I, Christ, and if I, Christ, would have your conversation honest amongst the Gentiles from the earth, from the earth. If your conversation will be honest in the earth, he says, I. Because when your conversation is being honest and you'll be obedient to every ordinance, because there is no power that be that is not of God, and you're being obedient for the Lord's sake, you are lifting up Jesus from the earth. And when you do that, will draw all men unto me. He then, through your obedience, your anastrophe, your honest conduct, because again, they're watching you. They're watching you. He said they will behold. What you do when they behold and see your conduct, Jesus said, I'll draw all men unto me. Thank you, Holy Ghost. So this is why we go back to Titus. Titus says, because Jesus desired the honest conduct out of the believer, the obedience out of the believer, because this is what Jesus desire, because he also desires to draw men unto him. He says, put them in mind to be subject to the principalities and powers. Not only to be subject to them. Hey, Google, what's the definition of subject? Here's the definition of subject, a person or thing that is being discussed, described, or dealt with. A person or thing that is being described or dealt with, subject. 
So he tells us to put them mind to be subject. Put them in mind as the word of God is being described to them. Tell them to be subject unto it. Pay attention to the principalities and powers. And not only pay attention, but obey magistrates, your pastors, the rulers, lawmakers, obey the laws. And after that, to be ready to every good work. Be ready to every good work. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 7. Go to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. While you're going to Romans chapter 7, he says... I'm reading Titus 3, to obey magistrates and to be ready to every good work, which means some preparation got to take place. You don't get to good works and just do good. That's not how it works. You, you, you got to obey the principalities in the preparation to do good. Or the preparation to do evil. The work is already there. The work has all the good works is already they already exist. God has already established good works. Evil works have already existed. God has allowed Satan to establish them. God has allowed Satan to create evil works. He has allowed him to do that. And nothing has been created that was not created by God. The evil works that was created, God allowed Satan to create them. So in Romans, he said us for us to be ready. Romans 7 and 19. Let's start at 18. No, let's start at 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. But I am carnal, sold under sin. The law is spiritual, but I am carnal. Here's an acknowledgement. God is righteous, and I am wrong. God is righteous. I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, being ready to good works, the Apostle Paul writes here, say, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Preparing yourself to do good works. Because again, the works are already created. But you got to be ready because he says ready. He used the word ready. Ready to every good work. We know what ready means. Ready is preparation. So Paul says, he acknowledged that he's come, sold under the sin. For that which I do, I allow not. The good works that's in him, because he's not ready, he allow them not. For what I would, I would do, but because I'm not ready, 
because I didn't submit and I wasn't obedient to the ordinances, because I didn't prepare myself, I allowed them not. So he says, what I would, that do I not. He don't do them because why? He ain't ready. He ain't ready for good works. And because the preparation wasn't made, because he didn't submit, because he didn't obey the ordinances of God, because he didn't obey his teachers. But what I hate, the things that he shouldn't do, the things that God has delivered him from, the things that God says that goes against the law. What he say he do? That do I. He find himself doing the things that is contrary to what is in him. There's good in the righteousness of God. But if we don't submit ourselves to the law of God, and we don't submit ourselves to the magistrates, the pastors. I'll keep it simple for the people of God. If we don't submit ourselves to the pastors who's teaching us the word of God, we're not being ready for good works. As you go through the Bible class, as you go through the Sunday morning service, as you go through the bishop's desk, this is getting ready for the good work. But you don't do that. Because something has happened in your life and it has caused you to lose focus in your preparation. And so now the things that you hate, you'll find yourself doing. If then I do that which I would not, now he found himself doing the things that he shouldn't do. I consent unto the law that it is good. If then I do that which I would not. If then I do that which I would not. I consent unto the law that it is good. So then the things that he's doing that he shouldn't do, he consent unto the law. He made he, he, he confessed that that which I do, it's good. He's saying that it is good. He's saying that the wrong that he is doing because he has consented unto it, he's confessing that it's good. Now then, it is no more I that do it. But sin that dwelleth in me. He's no longer. He has stepped out of who he is. He has stepped out of his true identity in Christ. It's no longer me that do it. But he acknowledged, but it's the sin that has taken over him. Why? Because he wasn't ready for the good work. He didn't prepare himself for the good work. Somewhere in his life, he submitted to the sin in his life. For I know that in me, he acknowledges, that is, he put in parentheses here, that is in my flesh. He's talking about his flesh. He's He's making a declaration here that he is both spiritual and physical. Because when he's talking about me, he's talking about him. He's talking about the true him, who he is in Christ. But then he make a distinct separation of the natural man when he says that is in my flesh. Dwelleth no good thing. ETH is always there. There's two parts of myself I'm dealing with. There's the true me who is born in Christ, who has been renewed, the new man in me that is Christ. But I still exist in my existence who was created by God, but is under 
the law of sin for the eternal because no flesh will see God. He says that is in my flesh dwelleth no good things. For to will is present with me. Good is always present with me. It's always. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. He's taking some personal accountability here. He says, for to will is present with me. But how to perform that, which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. The good that is present in him. He don't follow that. He don't do it. But the evil, which I would not, that I do. This goes back to submission, where we begin. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be good to the king as supreme. Had Paul submitted to the good in him, he would have been submitting unto the ordinances of God for the Lord's sake. But he says he didn't. He makes known that his flesh has no good thing in it. He's basically saying here, because, thank you, Holy Ghost. Again, tying it back to 1 Peter chapter 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts. This is what Paul is dealing with, fleshly lusts. And, and, and what he's dealing with now is the war against the soul, which so many of us deal with as believers. He's dealing with the war of the soul now. Because he would not submit to the ordinances and to do right. He did not prepare himself to be ready for the good. So because he didn't prepare himself for the ready by being obedient unto God, he can't find good. He can't find the good works that's in him. That has already been created by God. The good works are already in you. They have already been created by God. But you have to be ready to find them. That I am you. But if you submit to your flesh that dwelleth no good thing, the sin that dwells in you is going to be hard. It's going to be impossible to find the good work. You're going to find yourself in this war of your soul, just like Paul did. Now, if I do that, I would not. If I do the wrong, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. If you follow the principality of evil that exists in this world, you're no longer walking in your true identity in Christ Jesus. You're now minding the deeds of your flesh. I find then the law, I, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is always with me. Because the preparation is not made. He's always being introduced and he can always find the evil. But when preparation is made, when, when submission is performed, you won't find evil present. You'll find the good works. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. So then he's finding himself. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. 
But while he's doing that, but I see another law and my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. He see the goodness of Jesus in him, but he also see the evil in his own flesh. And every time he allows himself to be subject, paying attention unto the members of his flesh, it pulls him into captivity. Not being ready. Not being ready, as Titus says. Not being ready for the good works. So he tells us to put you in mind to be subject unto the principalities, to watch, to pay attention to the powers, and to obey. See, it all goes back to obeying, being submissive, being subject, being subject to obey. Because when you do that, you become ready for the good works. So when the evil present itself, because you're ready, you're able to separate the two and make a choice to follow that which is good. He warned against the law of his mind and bringing him into captivity to the law of sin, which is in his members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So you have to be wise here to be able to separate. He, he clearly says this. He said, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So look what he says. Ah, so then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. Okay. So, with my heart, if I'm obedient unto God, I serve him. But if I mind the deeds of my flesh, then I serve sin. So then I won't serve my flesh, I'll serve my mind. Because my mind has been renewed in God through Christ Jesus. So, I understand now that I'm two part. If I follow my mind, I'm following God because God has changed my mind. But if I follow my flesh, I'm following the, the law of sin, which is unto death. So I make a choice to follow the law of my mind where God is. And, and, and in doing that, it makes me ready unto good works. Yeah. So then, so then Titus goes back in Titus chapter three. Now that you have not, now that you're now following the law of your mind and not your, the law of your heart and not your flesh, he says, now you have the power, he says, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, be gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. So now you have that power and authority to produce these good works. You have the good, you have the power to not speak evil of no man, not to be a brawler, to be gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Now, because you're ready and because you're following the law of your mind and not the law of your flesh, you can produce these good works. Now you're ready to produce these good works. We're going to stop right there. And I think even, even, even um, 1 Peter 14, we've kind of covered. Or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, 
that with well doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. So we'll start in verse 15 on next week. I pray that the word of God has been a blessing to you. I know it was a blessing unto me. And so have a great week. Be safe. And this is the bishop's desk. Uh, sorry for my getting up. But I got to check out of here. Bye-bye.